Good afternoon. I'm Professor Brian Walker, for those of you who don't know me, in the School of Public Service. I'm a, a professor in Global Studies and Political Science. Um, I'm happy today to um, have a, um, a very interesting talk provided by Dr. Natasha Bell. She's joining us from Arizona State University. But before I introduce her, I want to give thanks to the people who helped make this event possible. First, I want to thank the uh, School of Public Service Research Committee and the departments or programs of Global Studies, Political Science, Urban Studies, as well as the Gender Equity Center for supporting her work. In addition, I want to uh, thank Dr. Michael Allen and uh, Julia Caminelli for organizing her visit. Um, Dr. Natasha Bell um, is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. She did her PhD at UCLA, um, she, which she finished in 2010. Uh, she did her undergraduate work at Smith, is it Smith College or just Smith? Smith College. Smith College, which is located in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Good. Okay. Um, her work focuses on race, ethnicity, gender studies, and comparative politics today. Her talk today is going to be focused on um, her recently published book titled Gendered Citizenship, Understanding Gendered Violence in Democratic India. The format for today is She'll present for 30 to 35 minutes, and then we'll have a round for a question and answer. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Natasha Bell. So podiums are not designed for human beings um, of my size, so can you see me okay? Um, I want to begin by thanking everyone um, who's come together to bring me out and to um, who's supported the research and, and the talk. It's um, the research itself, as you'll find, is really interdisciplinary, and so I was really uh, happy to see that so many programs and so many departments came together to um, to bring me out and to support the research, and so I am so grateful. Um, and uh, uh, said so thank you, and uh, I hope you find it to be um, impactful and powerful. So, some scholars assume that citizenship is a neutral and universal concept determined by constitutions and laws. Other scholars assume that citizenship is a legal status, and that once this legal status is achieved, then everyone enjoys equality. My book, Gendered Citizenship, challenges this kind of thinking. I argue that legal approaches to citizenship are insufficient. These kinds of approaches overlook the complex daily lived experience of citizenship. Oh, you know what? I forgot to do this, you guys. Okay. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, they overlook the complex daily lived experience of citizenship. These approaches ignore the fact that citizenship is experienced unequally depending on intersecting categories such as class, caste, race, gender, and sexuality. Therefore, simply counting the number of women in elected legislatures will not secure equality. Merely adopting Equality clauses in constitutions will not secure equality. So in response, I advance what I call situated citizenship, a theory and methodology to understand the contradictory nature of democracy and the uneven experience of citizenship. I call for an understanding of citizenship that is both legal status and embodied social relation. As legal status, situated citizenship requires an analysis of citizens' access to social, civil, and political rights. As an embodied social relation, situated citizenship requires uh, a reflection on how power relations affect a citizen's standing in all spheres of life from the intimacy of the home to the institutions of government. Situated citizenship does not assume equality as the starting point. Rather, it, ex it explores how supposedly equal citizens experience the promise of formal equality 
in all spheres of life. In particular, what I do in the book is I examine Sikh, Sikh women and the Sikh community as a minority religious community in India. So I, I examine Sikh women's participation in devotional organizations that are called Sukhmini Seva societies to show how situated citizenship can expand the very meanings and understandings of citizenship. I demonstrate how situated citizenship <coughs> moves us beyond narrow definitions of the political that focus on state and government, and how it moves us beyond Western notions of citizenship, which assume that strong religious ties are antithetical to modern understandings of citizenship. So what can we learn from a situated approach to citizenship? Let me take a moment to make a case for this kind of scholarship. Why do the punitive effects of gender and race persist in liberal democracies despite constitutional guarantees to the contrary? My research provides a model of how to study gendered and racialized citizenship. It helps to explain why the promise of democratic equality remains unrealized, and it identifies potential ways to create more egalitarian <coughs> relations. Why is it so difficult to eradicate oppression through legal reform? My research serves as a model of how to explain seemingly unsolvable problems in liberal democracies. From the tension between law in the books and law in practice, to uh, the inconsistencies between an individual's commitment to equality and their racist, sexist, and homophobic practices. How might a situated approach to citizenship contribute to political science? My research provides a model of how to open up new areas of inquiry, ask new research questions, find new sources of data, and identify new puzzles for methodologically plural research in political science. How might a situated approach to citizenship, oh, there's room in the front if you want to come to the front. So, how might a situated approach to citizenship make sense of Jyoti Singh's experience? So what I'll do is turn our attention to Jyoti Singh and share a bit of her story. On December 16, 2012, Jyoti Singh and her male friend were attacked on a bus in Delhi, India. The attack lasted 40 minutes. Six men gang raped Jyoti Singh sexually assaulted her with an iron rod, slapped her in the face, kicked her in the abdomen, and bit her lips, cheeks, and breasts. Afterwards, they dumped the victims on the side of the road and tried to run them over. Jyoti Singh died a few weeks later. Her friend survived. Sadly, Jyoti Singh's experience is emblematic of women's experience in democratic India. On the one hand, Indian democracy is noteworthy because it has secured women's equality through its constitution and laws. On the other hand, Indian democracy has failed women, which is evident in nearly every indicator of women's status. Sex ratio, infant mortality, literacy rates, employment, life expectancy. On the one hand, India is remarkable because women have served as prime minister, president, state leaders, and party leaders. On the other hand, India is the most dangerous country in the world for women. On the one hand, India is a democratic success story with the largest and most dem diverse democracy in the world. On the other hand, gendered violence in India undermines women's access to that very democracy. Given these contradictions, my research asks, why do we find pervasive gender-based violence in India when the Constitution is committed to caste and gender equality? I focus on the Indian case because 
The Indian Constitution guarantees equal rights for women, and yet gender equality hasn't been achieved. The contradictions I describe are not unique to India. The questions I raise are not limited to democratic India. We can ask these very questions of virtually all liberal democracies, including the United States, where the Constitution does not guarantee equal rights for women. As a methodological approach, situated citizenship requires sensitivity to embodied lived experience, meaning-making processes, and self-reflexivity. It also expands existing approaches of studying citizenship to include interpretive approaches. And this includes such things as interview, autoethnography, ethnography, discourse analysis, archival research, participatory action research. Lastly, it requires that as researchers, we be situated within the local context to understand citizenship. I engaged in participant observation and conducted in-depth, semi-structured interviews with members of the Sikh community <coughs> in Punjab, India. Followers of the minority Sikh faith understand their religious community as a space of gender and caste equality. The research was carried out over multiple trips to India, uh, to Punjab from 2000 to 2010. During this time, I was embedded in local communities and I participated in social, political, and religious activities. I conducted two sets of um, interviews based on snowball sampling. The first was during winter 2004 with 30 female politicians in Mohali district. And the second was in spring 2009 with uh, 40 research participants, men and women, both in Mohali and Amritsar districts. The interviews were conducted in Punjabi. And I asked research participants about their opinions on religion and gender, women's roles, personal law, dowry deaths or dowry murders, and sex ratio. I use broad, open-ended questions to allow participants to define key concepts such as woman and equality on their own terms. By doing so, I gathered co-generated data on gender roles. I transcribed uh, each interview and then developed a coding scheme to interpret participants' responses. I also developed the concept of exclusionary inclusion to capture the contradictory nature of democracy in all spheres, uh, to capture the contradictory experience of democracy in all spheres of life, from private belief to the institutions of government. These contradictions reinforce an unequal experience, but they can also renegotiate that unevenness and even challenge it. Exclusionary inclusion refers to a range of practices, legal, institutional, ideological, uh, embodied, and material practices that cause limited membership in different domains. Exclusionary inclusion allows participants um, or different entities to minimize their own participation in discrimination while advancing other interests over equality. Here I have in mind other interests such as majority group domination, minority rights, religious autonomy, family values, national security, national unity, and so on. Exclusionary inclusion often operates in reinforcing fashion across different domains. And yet, these sites are independent of one another. As a result, as scholars, we can't assume that social relations are experienced uniformly across all of these sites. In fact, this is an open empirical question and one I set out to explore in the book. So I put Jyoti Singh's experience in conversation with ethnographic data from the Sikh community to call attention to what I'm calling a continuum of gender violence. 
from the most horrific to the more mundane experiences. At one end of, at one end of the spectrum is violent sexual assault. At the other end of the spectrum are gendered norms that determine who has access to food, health care, education, inheritance, and property rights. I make visible the similar logics at play across this spectrum. I find that gendered violence compounded by intersecting categories such as caste, religion, class, and sexuality is used to control women's bodies to limit their democratic participation and to police their behavior in civil society, religious community, and home. Gendered violence undermines women's, undermines the promise of democratic equality and it puts women's lives at risk. It causes them to be second-class citizens. I also map the mechanisms of exclusionary inclusion across different domains. And so you'll see what I've put up here is the different domains that I am studying, home, civil society, religious community, and the state. And I show uh, the similar gender norms operating in these different spaces. I show how gender norms, or sorry, I show how gender violence often operates in a reinforcing fashion across these different sites, including state, civil society, religious community, and home. I show how similar gender norms operate in the state-citizen relation and in interpersonal, religious, and kinship relations to justify and normalize gender violence. I also identify the consequences of exclusionary inclusion. I show how gender norms limit women's access to public space and to material security. I also show how informal rules are used in all spheres to police women and to determine their standing and worth. And yet, these are independent sites. So we can't assume that social relations are experienced the same across these different sites. Again, this is an open empirical question. I examine this question by conducting the first empirical study of Sikh devotional organizations known as Sukhmani Seva societies. The book weaves together an analysis of sexual violence law with an ethnography of the Sikh community to demonstrate how secular mechanisms exclude women in the name of inclusion and how Religious spaces can be an unexpected site for democratic participation. I use ethnographic data to show how some Sikh women link gender equality and religious freedom as shared goals. These women gain access to public spaces, build solidarities across differences, and create more egalitarian relations. So let me take this moment to uh, reflect a bit on my positionality in the research process. Um, and I put this slide up because this article goes into um, depth on, on my positionality both in the academy and in the field. How did research participants' perception of me affect what I saw and what I learned? Several aspects of my identity were and are salient. I'm a Punjabi Sikh woman, born in the United States to upper caste authorized immigrant parents from Punjab, India. I speak English and Punjabi. I practice the Sikh faith, but have not been baptized and do not keep unshorn hair. I'm short in stature, petite in build, and have dark black hair and a wheat colored complexion a complexion that is understood as fair and desirable in India and as non-white and undesirable in the United States. Given these facts, research participants often saw me as a diasporic researcher. My Punjabi language mastery, my race, ethnicity, religion, and family contacts opened up access. However, I simultaneously 
encounter disadvantages. Some research participants questioned my religiosity. Others saw me as a girl, not a woman. As a lay person, not a scholar. Research participants disavowed my position as knowledge producer through some of the very gendered norms that create women's exclusionary inclusion in India. So now um, let's get back to the book. Each chapter of the book examines women's negotiation of exclusionary inclusion in multiple domains, from the intimacy of the home to public life. Chapter two advances a theory and methodology of situated citizenship, which is then used in the rest of the book to make visible the mechanisms and consequences of exclusionary inclusion. Chapter three, focuses on women's uneven experience of the Indian state through an examination of the 2012 gang rape. This chapter asks, can scholars and activists turn to the law as a liberatory strategy when it creates women's unequal citizenship? I argue that the progressive political opening and the re-entrenchment of patriarchal norms following Jyoti Singh's murder are emblematic of the Indian state's radical promise of equality, and its horrific, its horrific failure to achieve this equality. An analysis of politicians' responses demonstrates how gendered norms are used to exclude women in the name of inclusion. This analysis highlights the difficulty of, of eradicating gender norms, um, sorry, of eradicating gendered violence through legal reform and demonstrates the unpredictability of the political process. In chapter four, I use interview data to map sick women's experience of exclusionary inclusion in civil society and in the home. This chapter asks, do sick women experience civil society or home as a site of liberatory politics. The ethnographic data reveals that sick women do not experience civil society as an uncoerced space of associational life. And they do not experience the home as a space of safety and security. Rather, gender violence is used in both spaces to remind women that they do not belong, and that they are always at risk. The risk changes and shifts, but there's always a risk. The risk could be lack of food, lack of money, right? The risk could be violence. The risk could be take the form of rumor and ridicule, but there's always a risk. What I'll do next is to focus in on chapter five, because I think chapter five really does the innovative and creative work of the book. So chapter five examines sick women's participation in all female Sukhmini Seva societies. Some scholars assume that strong religious ties are antithetical to modern citizenship. Others assume that state citizen relations are democratic and religious relations are non-democratic. Still others assume that, assume that the liberal state protects women through law, while religious communities subordinate women through traditional practice. Chapter five upends these assumptions. The chapter asks, can sick women move beyond prescribed gender roles through their participation in Sukhmini Seva societies? Do sick women experience devotional organizations as sites of liberatory politics. In the chapter, I put intersectionality studies in conversation with scholarship on women's religious agency to open up more diverse understandings of agency and liberation. I find that some sick women create more egalitarian relations by contingently aligning two distinct definitions of liberation, spiritual liberation and gender-based liberation. So Sukhmini Seva societies are devotional organizations 
whose primary objective is seva, or service, to their community and promotion of Sikhi, or Sikh faith. Their activities are tied to local gurdwaras or temples. So many seva societies rarely engage in formal politics. As a result, it would be easy to understand these women's actions as apolitical. This would be a mistake. Similarly, Sukhmani Seva societies also rarely engage in feminist struggles. As a result, it would be easy to understand these, women, ex, these women's actions as anti-feminist. Again, this would be a mistake. What is required is a more expansive definition of the political. To understand that religious affiliations can be a means for enacting citizenship in a liberal democracy. What is also required is a rethinking of the feminist subject to understand that religiosity can be a means for attaining gender-based liberation. So I will read this to you. I know it's a lot of text for the slide, um, but I will, I will share this with you. Um, so let me share this quote from Hardeep Kaur Bedi, a 55-year-old upper caste woman who is a founding member of a Sukhmani Seva society. When this Gurdwara was first made, it opened up once every month. However, once we established our Sukhmani Seva society, we made an organization for devotional singing. We did this because this is a Hindu village. Therefore, most engage in Jai Mataji, Jai Mataji. But I would say, Maharaj, we should hear Vaheguru, Vaheguru throughout the village. And now, that, and now that it has happened, I am very pleased. And now if you look at it, in every home, there is a woman affiliated with the Sukhmani society. And in every home, people are taking Maharaj's name. And in our neighboring villages, women have followed our lead, and they have established Sukhmani Seva societies too. So Bedi expresses her longing for a vibrant Sikh community in a village where Sikh religious life was absent. This longing motivates Bedi and her fellow female Sevadars, or volunteers, to intervene in and transform Gurdwara life. Bedi is pleased that with Guru's grace, she and her Sukhmani Seva society actualized her vision of hearing Jai Mataji alongside Vaheguru. Bedi and her fellow Sevadas link gender equality and religious freedom as shared goals while preserving religious pluralism. They create a harmonious relationship between the minority Sikh, sorry, minority Sikh community and the majority Hindu village. Bedi and other Sevadas influenced all homes in their own village and inspired women in other villages. This is one example of how Sikh women created more egalitarian relations, both interpersonal and community relations. This is one example of how Sikh women realized a vision of spiritual and gender-based liberation as joint goals. What I'm suggesting is that we consider Bedi's actions, her devotional acts, as citizenship acts. Bidhi contributes to her community by radically transforming a defunct Gurdwara into a vibrant public space. She also creates a network of local Sukhmani Seva societies that transform gender norms and gender roles. Bidhi's actions show how religious spaces can be an unexpected site for democratic participation and inclusion. A situated approach to citizenship does not assume a singular definition of liberation. Rather, it enables a co-generated understanding of the concept. Similarly, such an approach does not assume that gender equality is tied to secularization. It it, rather, it leaves open the possibility of achieving gender justice in both secular and religious spaces. 
So now let me take a moment to reflect on my motivations in the research process. Um, and I put up this slide because um, in this Feminist Formations article that was recently published, I go into this at much at, at greater length. Um, so why do I use situated studies of citizenship to uncover a deeper understanding of citizenship's history and future? Why is it that I do research on the relationship between violence and citizenship in democratic societies? In a post-September 11th environment, my father, Dr. Ashok Bell, was shot and nearly killed in our home in California. The perpetrator of this violent act was found guilty of attempted <coughs> murder, perpetrating a, hype, a hate crime, shooting into a residence, and causing great bodily injury. The perpetrator was motivated by hatred, racism, and ignorance. He thought that my father, a, an Indian-born physician, was an Arab, a terrorist, and a threat to the United States. I pursued graduate training to understand my family's experience of racial violence and to perhaps eradicate racial violence. I went to graduate school to ask, how is membership and belonging determined? How does race, religion, and national origin impact one's status as citizen? Who is included and who is excluded? And most importantly, can citizenship be more inclusive, more democratic? Violence for me is not an abstract concept. It is a lived, embodied experience. I too am a victim. I share with you and I recount the horrific details of Jyoti Singh's murder and my father's attempted murder because lives are at stake, because it highlights for us the profound tragedy of paradoxical democracy. So I end with a question that I think still remains unanswered, a significant question that remains unanswered. Given that political scientists have largely ignored decades of feminist scholarship, is political science willing to listen to new forms of knowledge based on situated approaches to citizenship, especially when this knowledge is often characterized as invalid. I fear that if we are not open to feminist approaches, then political science will fail to ask important research questions, will fail to find new sources of empirical data, and will ultimately fail to understand why the promise of democratic equality remains unrealized. So thank you, and I will uh, now take questions and uh, respond to any comments or feedback. what solves the problem. And I think um, that it's a kind of democracy that is open to difference, a kind of democracy that is uh, where there will be, there will be disagreement, right? There will be, it's not that you'll always have consensus, but there's a way in which that could occur um, there where there's mutual respect, 
where there is civility and there's a, a cultivating of that skill set. Okay? Um, because democracy is, it's, it's a way of life and it's what we do, right? And how are we making our spaces democratic? Okay? It's what do I do in the classroom? How do I teach? And am, am I creating a space in which we can build, we can do what these women do in the Sukhumi Seva Society, so to build solidarity across differences and to hear each other and to see each other um, and to say that we don't have to agree and we don't have to like each other, but that doesn't mean that we need to, that, that violence is very, right, the, the there are other ways of going about this, right, than gendered or racialized violence uh, of navigating difference. So that would be my response. Um, Nisha, and then, or do you want to go first? Rishman. Yes, Rishma, then Nisha. <coughs> no, but who has first? Oh, Nisha, you, you were first. Yes. You were first. <laughs> Thank you for this lovely talk, Natasha. Thank, Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Um, and you know, I mean, I'm bubbling with questions right yes. now. <laughs> um, um, and so it'll be a little longish, so no. forgive me, everyone. So um, what I'm thinking is, you know, your research is from 2000 to 2009, you said 10. Yes, the actual right. ethnographic right. work, yes. So politically, India has gone through this gamut of changes, yes. right? It's true, democracy, big D, yes. paradox, we, we've seen all of it. But also what we are seeing today is this huge saffronization of Hindu yes. India, right? Mm -hmm. And what that has done is, it's not only the Hindu majority, it's also, to some extent, the minorities are also holding on to that yes. religious identity. Yes. And that can also be detrimental Absolutely. in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was intrigued when you uh, yes. brought that example of Hardi Kaur Bedi, yes. or like Supreme Minister. And so she said, I'd love, you know, what gave her immense pleasure was replacing of Jai Mata Ji yes. with Vaheguru, yes. right? But not so, replacing, for them to be heard together. Right? And but but she says somewhere that I both. was happy now the village was saying, you know, whatever. Yeah. But there is still that agenda, right, of, oh, yes. of, of Trump. And so it's still within that religious um, identity. Right. So, so I was wondering how you negotiate, how, sort of, how did you treat that or what was your understanding, like, you know, how. And the other part of this question is, what kind of relationship does the Sukhmini society, you know, yes. um, since they have with other parts of India? Because this is, yes. you know, what, because there are different small, this, uh, you know, movements happening. Exactly. So what kind of um, relationship they have, if any, and yes. what is the liaison there? So uh, I'll take the, the first question first. And so, so for those of you who aren't, aren't as steeped in this as, as the group here is, right, <laughs> the, the India group, um, there's this impasse in India because you have the relationship between gender, state, and religious community that is at, a, at an impasse. And, 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 and what we're referring to here is that um, in some ways, the Hindu right has uh, used this move towards uniform civil, um, the, uni the UCC, a replacement of personal law with the UCC, a uniform civil code, as a way, they are very much for it. And what they see it as is a way to um, replace personal law with a kind of law that can be Hindu law, right? So that's a way of, of maintaining Hindu hegemony through uniform law. And in India, you find this really difficult position where feminist, Indian feminists at one point in time and the Hindu right were at the same, had the sa agreed on the same policy prescription both wanted a UCC because the, the feminists thought this is a way to navigate personal law which is highly discriminatory to all women irrespective of what religion we're talking about. If it's the uh, majority Hindu personal law or if it's the minority religious personal law. And this is the kind of impasse that both scholars, activists, and individuals, ordinary individuals find themselves in, in, in the Indian context that you've got the Hindu right on one side, um, but then there's no, it becomes very difficult, there's no, there's not much space to navigate. Uh, and so how do you do this? And for the women, what I find, and what I wanna push back on here with this nexus of gender, state, and religious community 
is that we have to see what these women are doing, actually doing empirically on their daily lives, and how are they experiencing religious community, and how are they navigating and negotiating religious community. And we can't just inform, we can't just assume from the outset that those spaces are wholly oppressive. And the interesting thing is that these Sikh women use these Sikh many Sela societies to do something interesting, to push back on gender norms. But what I also point out in chapter five is they also simultaneously police other women. So it's not that it's this wholly liberatory space. They are themselves maintaining certain kinds of gender norms, and it's specifically gender norms around uh, purity and pollution that stick, and they have trouble uh, to moving beyond that. Uh, so that would be one. The other is these Sukhmini Seva societies are completely unaffiliated with any kind of a, with the Akal Takht or with the, um, the so that would be the, um, my, what would be my English language for this? The, um, uh, the actual religion, right, with the institutionalized religion of Sikhism. And so the Sukhmini Seva societies are completely autonomous. They determine their own structure. They determine their own membership. They determine how they're going to collect money, how they're going to conduct service, where they're going to do it. Is it going to be in a gurdwara? Is it going to be in a home? Are they going to do both? Or what are, right? So they have a high degree of autonomy. And the question then was, what are they doing in these spaces? And they, these Sukhmini Seva societies exist throughout India. I haven't found them in outside of India. I don't think from, at this point, I haven't seen that they exist in the diaspora, but they do exist throughout India. Uh, but I only looked at them in Punjab. Does that yeah, it does. Um, so my question there was, you yes. know, like in Bengal, right? So we have a bowel group, mm -hmm. you know, that had been, so there's some kind of affiliation because as you were talking yesterday, it's kind of hard to navigate without the religious because culture and religion is so, so integral in, yeah. in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. But but these women, they also might be sitting in temples. But really, what they're doing is maybe they're talking to women from other religion, and they're saying, "Do away with religion." And that could be because we, you know, yes. West Bengal's political yes. communism and all of that. Also, because India, different states have different uh, political background, or it used to at least. Yes. So that was. But that's fine. Thank you very much. I think yeah. we. Yeah, I um, think we have more. And what was the uh, another part of this that was really so? How they are, you know, are they liaising? Is there any communication with these other small groups of women yes. across India yes. from the south? Oh no, that I can't answer the question. But locally, yes. And locally, so, yeah. but um, I don't know if it's happening across strict state lines. Right. Um, but what the other thing that's happening that's interesting is one of the Sukhmini Seva societies that I looked at, the membership was primarily non sikh oh, okay. and so it was mostly uh, Radha Swamis. Oh, yeah. And so Radha Swamis believe in a living guru, whereas Sikhs do not. They believe in the Guru Granth, which is like the, is the um, guru in the um, in, in the text, the holy text. It, um, and so they, but they were able to build alliances across religious difference. Then the other Sukhmani Seva society really did this work across caste lines. And so you had Bedi herself is upper caste. She's Katri. And so the Hindu women in the village wanted her to attend, the Kattri, as a Katri, to attend temp, a Hindu temple and didn't want her to be creating this Sukhmini Seva society and bringing the Gurdwara back to life. And they couldn't understand why she would pick a religious affiliation over a caste affiliation. And so she was actually working with other women of lower caste position to do this work. And so those would be the categories of difference that they uh, worked across. And the conversations they had were about a lot of different things. And a lot of the conversation they had was about labor in the home yeah. and how to navigate that gendered labor in the home to, to be engaged in Sufani Seva society. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Natasha, for the very enlightening talk. I have a, sort of a broader question about um, the status of women in India. So when it comes to their participation in the labor force, it's low. Women in office at the national and state level, low, local level high because they have gender quotas exactly. in place. Um, so I'm thinking about Ross's um, mm -hmm. argument. He is at UCLA, yes. you were there. And so he doesn't talk about violence against women. 
where he makes the argument that sort of the first step to enhance status of women is that women have to enter the labor force. What do you think, in terms of India, would that be sort of the first step for women to enhance their status more generally, and also then going beyond that to address uh, the violence against women, which is so, um, so Sundarajan's work, which is really informs my work, she also makes the same argument. It, she says that it's, it's employment that could possibly, so the way that I set up the book is to say, okay, law only gets us so far. And if law only gets us so far, then what are the next steps that need to be taken? Where could we potentially find more egalitarian practices, more empowerment, more you know, liberatory practices, whatever language you want to use for it. And Sundarajan's answer is employment. She thinks that that's where women will experience these things. Um, so, and, and other scholars right, point to different spaces. For me, I entered into this more in between this religious public space to see if it, if it might be occurring there. And I think it has to happen in all the spaces. And I think it has to happen simultaneously. That we, that these things need to happen in, in the home, in civil society, in religious com community, vis-a-vis -vis the state, employment, and, and commercial sector. Uh, but where are the most, the highest kind of barriers of entry for women, and where are they experiencing large degrees of, of gender violence? And the answer is in all of that. And so there's no easy answer, but I think employment would help, um, and the logic there makes sense, right, that they would have some kind of financial security, the financial security then would allow uh, maybe a, a way to add, to um, combat or push back against gendered violence and gendered norms, uh, and we see that, we see it historically, we see it in India, we see it in other places, uh, but the workplace is also not devoid of gender violence. So when women enter the workplace, they're being sexually harassed, they are being sexually assaulted, they are being, and so again there we would find, we, have, we would have to contend with that as well. Go back, and then I'll, I'll come to the back. I, um, I've had an opportunity to spend time with you, so I feel like I, there's a lot of the same with very similar um, concepts and views and our research. I'm curious if there's um, patterns um, that the women have to navigate that are due to settler colonialism and the way that colonialism has played out in the access to law and citizenship for for these women in, in the various groups that you and so colonialism is absolutely key here and part of the reason that you've got this nexus between gender state and religious community in India is because uh, the, the British, through colonial rule, um, created and maintained this personal law system, and the Constitution actually says that there's a directive in the Constitution that personal law uh, will be replaced by a, a uniform civil code, but it has not happened because for religious communities, it's one of the very few ways that they have to protect their autonomy. It's one of the very limited tools that they have to protect themselves and to maintain some kind of distinctness. And um, here I would point you to the scholarship of Christine Keating. She has a fantastic book on decolonizing democracy, and it's on, on India. Um, but she argues that there was this promise made at the moment at that in the anti-colonial struggle and through the creation of the Constitution where religious minority religious communities were given this the power to, uh, for patriarchal power um, and not given full power vis-a-vis -vis the majority Hindu uh, community, uh, community and that there were other institutional designs that could have been adopted that would have given them more power but that that didn't happen at that moment and so colonialism and that post-colonial moment and, and is very important and I think um, underlies a lot of what I'm describing here and discussing it. Uh,
Well, I'll go again, if, if that's okay. Is there anybody else? Or we can go and go. Okay, let me just um, <laughs> come in here, sorry. As she said, we are just invested in this. So in response to what um, Nisha was talking about employment, right, and Rajeshri Sundarajan, yes. what she yes. talks about. Um, you know, one thing in India is um, we didn't consider human capital. We have this huge number of women who work as domestic yeah. help. Yeah. So it's a very caste, class-based yes. issue. There are women who are in, in employment. We just don't consider that. So we have to... Uh, that, that's that's the largest thing. So we have to consider that that labor is not considered. So I think um, the question is not why we in India how we can do it. It's also the question of how we can incorporate these women. How do you bring yes. in um, the question of who is and who is not? Yeah, whose labor counts? Because these women exactly. are, are operating. They have been working yeah. the same way we talk about women of color have always been working in the United States. Yeah. That's the same thing that Dalit women, lower class women, lower caste women have been working, but their labor just hasn't been counted, and it occurs often in the informal sector. And so it is not protected, it does not count, it does not get measured, and that would go back to the, the Ross, you know, the critique of that, that kind of work. Yes, you. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know names, so I apologize. No, I Thank you so much for being here. I wondered if you could talk, um, I want to go read it, of course, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the article. I can't remember quite the yes. title, but something about violence in academia. Yes. Could you, could you talk a little bit about yes. that one? So there's, okay, so this one? Yeah. Yes. So this piece uh, just got published in um, Feminist Formations, and what I did in this piece was to talk about the experience of racial violence as the motivation for me to go to graduate school. Um, and so I talk about the hate crime is my, um, <coughs> that is that in, initial motivation, and then I map my movements throughout um, academic spaces as a graduate student, as a visiting professor, as an assistant professor, right? I go through, and I mean, even as an undergraduate student, so I go through, um, and then at multiple institutions, small liberal arts colleges and public universities. And what I find and what was so surprising is that I went into the academy thinking that it would be a place of political possibility that it would be a place of meritocracy, that it would be a place that was liberatory. And what, what I experienced was gendered violence. So I was sexually harassed, <coughs> both in the field, but also by mentors and professors right, in the academy. And so I unpack all of that. And, and so racial violence and gendered violence, and, and then how some of us are more likely to be the subject of gender violence because not just because of our embodied positionality as outsiders, right, as, as women of color, but also for the methodological and epistemological choices I make. And so political science is not a place that um, is often open to interpretive research. It's not a space that is often open to feminist and critical scholarship. And so that then placed me even more on the margins of the discipline. Right? My embodied positionality placed me on the margins as a, as a woman of color who appears, who is very petite and appears very young, right? And then on top of that has um, made these epistemological and methodological choices. And so it was this, there's this double kind of marginalization that I'm navigating and multiple kinds of violences that I'm navigating in the academic space. Other questions? I'm wondering what is we it? have a time, so you have to keep trying to Sorry. <laughs> let's, let's, yeah, let's do one or two more questions, and we'll wrap up. Um, on that, I also have been navigating the, I have to be reflexive in my work because of um, the way that my community interprets um, responsibility and ethical responsibility mm -hmm. to my community. In political science, that's really not a practice, and it really challenges the notions of objectivity. And I'm wondering if you can speak more on your experience navigating that in, in your work now. Yeah. Yes. 
Great question. Um, and I would say there are some spaces in political science that are doing it. So look to feminist IR. There's some spaces there. There's gender and politics spaces that are kind of opening this up in a lot and doing some of those work within political science. But you're correct to say it's not dominant, right? It's very much the kind of um, on the margins of the discipline. Um, it has been difficult to navigate. It has been difficult to navigate and um, uh, and it has been costly to navigate. And so there's certain kinds of networks and resources I don't have access to and I've never had access to. Um, and those were choices I made early on in my graduate training, and I've kind of just stuck with the choices, but there are costs associated with them. Um, it is also potentially powerful, because what has now happened is that my very kind of marginality to the discipline both as in, in my embodied positionality, but also in my methodological and, 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 and epistemological choices, has now allowed me to do a, the kind of scholarship that is often not happening in political science. And so what I do in the book is to put norm, take normative theory and empirical theory and bring it together in a creative way that is, that is um, this is hard for me to say, but I'll say what, what reviewers are saying about the book is that it is, I've brought it together in a way that is actually challenging some of the underlying concepts of political science. Say, what do we mean by citizenship? What do we mean by democracy? And, uh, and that is, that part of it has been really powerful. Uh, but that, but the, so the marginality has led to something really creative, but there's been, um, pain also associated with that, and cost also associated with that. Is there one more question? <coughs> thank you so We're much. We're all done. Let me turn it Thanks to everybody for coming today. Thanks for the people who organize. And if you have any additional questions, come on up to the front and talk to Dr. Ball. Thank you.